Number 10, treadmill punishment. While getting on a treadmill today can feel like a punishment in itself, back in the Victorian era, prisoners were assigned to the treadmill as a real punishment. Yeah, you can't get off this one. You would think they're only making prisoners stronger, but there is a method behind this madness. Listen up. The treadmill was invented by Sir William Cubitt in 1818. The treadmill was used not only for grinding corn, but mainly as a punishment. Corn and punishments, my two favorite things. Prisoners would step on 24 spokes of a large paddle wheel, causing it to turn. While originally intended for productive work, it quickly became a form of punishment. Yeah, somebody saw it and was like, you know what? I know how to make this awful. Get on there. The repetitive physical strain of the treadmill made it one of the most dreaded among inmates. Just thinking about a treadmill right now is making my legs shake. Let's move on. Number nine, Amelia Dyer. During the Victorian era, rapid industrialization led to urban expansion, bringing with it increased disease, poverty, and unemployment. All those fun things that make a city. By 1856, the force had expanded to include inspectors tasked with investigating serious crimes. One notable event occurred in 1896 when reading detectives apprehended Amelia Dyer. She was convicted of multiple killings, the worst of the worst, the details of which I can't even say on YouTube or else our channel will get shut down. But the number of lives Amelia Dyer has taken, historians believe that number is around 400. 400, and a lot of them are quite young, by the way quite young. If it weren't for the Reading Borough Police Force and that small team of officers, who knows how many more lives would have been lost by the hands of one Amelia Dyer. Eight, transportation. In the 1800s, courts were looking for alternatives to hanging that were harsher than fines, but not as brutal as well, being hanged. Transportation then emerged as a viable punitive option. Initiated in 1717, this practice involved sending convicts away. Just sending them away to colonies, primarily in Australia at the time, where over 165,000 were transported over 80 years. Now, initially, convicts were housed on decrepit warships with a high mortality rate, of course, due to unsanitary conditions. But the majority of those transported were male, ranging from quite young, again, very young, to individuals that were over 80. It could be anyone, these boats were crazy. The journey often included stops in Gibraltar, the West Indies, South America, or the Cape of Good Hope to resupply provisions before reaching various Australian settlements. To which they go, you, get out. Okay, let's do it. Number seven, the crank. Oh, the crank, it sounds easy but you give it time. Prisoners often endured hard labor, such as breaking stones or turning the crank machine, which was a handle that convicts had to turn thousands of times a day, and often for no purpose other than punishment. Yeah, it's like a wheel that'll, uh, not a wheel, it's like a, this is a blooper, me going, it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's like those old cars where you had to roll the window down manually. It took you like seven and a half minutes. You're like, come on, I'm so hot. There we go, we found it. An example is the case of Oscar Wilde, who was sentenced to two years of hard labor for gross indecency. Now his prison experience, especially the hard labor, drastically affected his health and literary productivity. So far, this one here sounds the worst. At least with the treadmill, you got a little bit stronger over time, there's some sort of payoff. But turning a crank for no reason at all, I mean, maybe your one arm would get jacked, but... Other than that, you're just gonna destroy your body for no reason at all. What a nightmare. The Scold's Bridle was a sinister instrument of public humiliation from the Victorian era. Now this one, this one really sucked, I'm not gonna lie. We're gonna start cranking it up here, no pun intended. The device was used to punish unruly women who were accused of nagging or gossiping. Yeah, you talk to your friend, now you got the Scold's Bridle, enjoy. The Scold's Bridle resembled an iron cage almost. The bridle enclosed the head of the accused, while some versions featured a spiked or studded plate that was inserted into the mouth to suppress speech and causing, of course, excruciating pain. And if the wearer attempted to continue to gossip or talk. They were often paraded through the streets and the victim was subjected to public ridicule and scorn. Yeah, scorn, you ever been scorned before? That sucks. Turning the Scold's Bridle into a dreadful symbol of enforced silence and and societal control over women's voices and opinions. This one looks like a saw trap too. This was pretty brutal. It should have been number one, if anything. Number five, solitary confinement. You're grounded. And I really mean you're grounded. In the Victorian era, solitary confinement was a widely utilized form of punishment that embodied the period's harsh philosophy. Yeah, we're not cranking things. This time we're just, we're just thinking about our problems. It was known originally as the separate system and it was designed to isolate prisoners to reflect on their crimes and ideally reform. 
Rather, they just went absolutely insane. Inmates were confined in small, stark cells, cut off from all human contact and external stimuli. No sunlight, no hope, nothing. The silence and isolation were intended to prevent the corruption associated with the prisoner interaction and, of course, encourage penitence, right? You want to want to behave, of course. However, this extreme isolation often led to severe psychological effects, if anything, including mental breakdowns. I'd have a breakdown on day two, are you kidding me? I thought getting grounded as a kid was bad, but at least then I could see the sun, so not half bad considering what it used to be. Number four, branding. Now we're cooking. Branding was a brutal form of punishment often reserved for criminals convicted of the gravest offenses. I mean, obviously, you're getting your ass out. I would assume it's pretty bad. This punitive practice involved searing the skin of the convicted individual with a hot iron, typically marking them with a letter symbolizing their crime. So for instance, T for thief or M for murder. Performed publicly or within prison walls, branding was not only excruciatingly painful, but also served as a lifelong stigma because, well, that's not going anywhere. That's going to be there for life. It would permanently mark individuals as criminals and ostracize them from society. By the mid-19th century, this barbaric practice was, thankfully, phased out. Imagine if Victorians could see the movie Jackass 2. I wonder what they'd think of Bam Margera getting paid to be branded. Oh, how the times have changed. My God. Number three, public whipping. Public whipping was sadly a common measure in the Victorian era. It was a harsh and humiliating form of punishment. It was administered with a whip or, if you were really bad, a cat o' nine tails, which was a multi-tailed whip that inflicted severe pain. This punishment was often carried out in public squares to serve as a deterrent to others. Ideally, you'd look at them and go, wow, that's horrible. I'm never going to steal bread. Let's go home and then Bob's your uncle. The convicted person was typically tied to a whipping post, stripped to the waist, and then lashed a specific number of times, depending on the severity of said crime. The physical scars were complemented by the stigma of having been punished in full view of the community. Over time, as societal attitudes towards corporal punishment shifted, thankfully public whipping was increasingly seen as barbaric and was largely abolished by the end of the 19th century. Number two, the pillory and stocks. The pillory and stocks were prominent tools of public humiliation and shame. The pillory involved securing a person's head and hands in a wooden frame. You've probably seen this in any medieval times or whatever. They were usually elevated while stocks immobilized the offender's feet and sometimes their hand at ground level. Quite uncomfortable. Positioned in public squares, obviously, these devices exposed individuals to the ridicule and abuse of passerbyers who often hurled rotten food, mud, and verbal insults at you while you were just stuck there watching the whole thing. POV. Utilized for crimes such as petty theft, slander, and disorderly conduct, these punishments aimed not to only deter the offender, but also serve as a stark warning to the community as they're hucking mud pies at you, I guess. This one would suck. Everyone waits until your hands are locked up and now they want to talk, tell you how they feel. What a horrible time. I'd keep track of who's doing it and be like, okay, I'm coming back for you, sir. Number one, hanging. During the Victorian era, hanging was the ultimate form of capital punishment, reserved for the most serious offenses, such as treason and burglary, or of course, just killing another person. That'll, that'll probably do it. The execution was a public spectacle intended to deter criminal behavior within the community. Now, typically conducted at public gallows, the condemned person was dropped from a platform to ideally break the neck swiftly, though sometimes death by strangulation occurred prolonging the suffering that would be the worst my long neck I'd be I'd be screwed that would be that'd be two bricks right there famous individuals who met their end by hanging include Catherine Wilson who was suspected of multiple poisonings and then later hanged in 1862 and William Palmer the notorious ruggedly poisoner was hanged in 1856 and everyone watched and just ate their lunch like it was UFC they're like oh this is fun to watch bring the kids sure why not over time, public executions were moved behind prison walls to quell the spectacle and growing distaste among the populace. I think if I had to pick any of these, I would do the pillory and stocks. Again, I would keep track of every neighbor who was talking shit. Once these unlocked, I'm going right for you. Throwing those mud pies at me, get lost. From the oppressive silence of the silent system to the cruel confines of the gibbet, each punishment we're about to explore paints a vivid picture of a time when justice was as severe as it was merciless. So dim the lights, hold on to your seats, and let's uncover the macabre methods of control and correction that will leave you grateful to be living in the modern world. Are you ready for the historical horror show? Starting off today, we are diving into the world 
world of mental asylums. Mental asylums during the Victorian era are definitely not your modern day rehab center. These places were like the catch all bucket for anyone society didn't quite know how to handle. Not just for those grappling with mental illness, but also for people who just didn't fit the very tight Victorian mold. Got a rebellious streak or just too loud for your neighbors liking. You might just find yourself locked up in one of these gloomy asylums. And let me tell you, the conditions were nothing short of nightmarish. We're talking about overcrowding, minimal if any real mental health treatment, and methods of confinement that could make even the sanest person question their sanity. It was less about healing and more about hiding away the problematic ones out of society's sight. Imagine being treated more like a prisoner in a dungeon than a patient in a hospital. That was the harsh reality of Victorian mental asylums. Next up on our list today, we have Pen Fort A Dur. Imagine being accused of a crime in the not so good old days, and there you are, stubbornly refusing to plead guilty or not guilty because you know the system is rigged. Enter the nightmare fuel of the medieval world. This gruesome punishment method was something straight out of a horror flick. The accused would be laid flat and a board would be placed on top of their chest. Then stones, cold, heavy stones are piled onto the board one by one. The weight increases, the breathing gets harder, and why endure such torture? It's all because of a loophole. By not pleading guilty or not guilty, the accused could avoid a formal trial, which meant even if they died under the weight, their family could still inherit their stuff. It was a brutal, desperate gamble. Though officially scrapped just before the Victorian era kicked in, the sheer horror of this punishment lingered in the public memory, kind of like the ghost of punishment's past, whispering, be glad you live in the now. Next up, we are journeying over to the gibbet. The gibbet, or gibbeting, was like a horror movie of old school punishments. So picture this. After the execution took place, the criminal wasn't just buried and forgotten about. Nope, that would just be too easy, I guess. Their body instead was sometimes locked up in an iron cage and hung from a tall frame called a gibbet, kind of like a creepy bird cage, but for humans. This wasn't tucked away in some dark corner either. It was, of course, out in the open where everyone could see it. The body was left to hang there, decomposing in the open air, come rain or shine. Why the public display? Well, it was all about scare tactics. The sight of a swinging, decaying corpse was supposed to frighten anyone from thinking about breaking the law. Fair enough. It was a very stark, gruesome reminder plastered right in the town square. Break the law and you could be the next ghastly attraction. Yikes. Talk about a deterrent. I don't think I'd commit any crime after that, actually. It's crazy. <laughs> Even just like, uh, scared straight or whatever that show is. Like, that was enough for me. <laughs> Just a real dead body hanging in the middle of the town square. So scary. Okay. I don't think I'd do well in the Victorian era, but I guess they wouldn't do well now. Imagine showing like TikTok to a Victorian child. Next up on our list today, we are talking about hulks. Before dedicated prisons became widespread, hulks were a common form of punishment. At first, hulks sounds more like something from like a pirate adventure than real life, but trust me, it was far from a swashbuckling good time. Before the days of modern prisons, these old creaky warships, stripped of their glory and no longer seaworthy, were anchored permanently in harbors to house prisoners. Imagine being crammed into the dank, dark belly of a decommissioned ship with scores of other unfortunate souls. Conditions on these floating prisons were nothing short of nightmarish. They were overcrowded, they were festering with disease, and the air was thick with despair. Prisoners were often put to back-breaking work during the day, maybe hammering away at shipbreaking or toiling in nearby docks or riverbanks. And life on a hull was just a grim, a slow, and a steady descent into misery, making it one of the punishments from the past that was as much a about enduring harsh conditions as it was about serving time. Next up on our list today, we have 
shame. Public humiliation was a go-to tactic in the punishment playbook during the Victorian era and honestly even before that. Imagine being caught for a petty theft or a public nuisance and instead of just serving time or getting a ticket, you're slapped with a giant sign spelling out your crime and then you are paraded around town. Or perhaps you'll find yourself locked in the stocks, stuck in one uncomfortable position in the town square. Here, everyone from cheeky kids to stern old timers could get a good look at you and they didn't just stare. <laughs> of course not. They jeered, they tossed rotten tomatoes, or worse, sometimes. It wasn't just about making you rethink your life choices, it was about showing everyone else what could happen if they stepped out of line. This kind of punishment turned lawbreakers into live lessons in morality with a side of entertainment Victorian style. Kinda makes you glad that all you get is a parking ticket these days, right? I'm just saying, alright? Put that in the gratitude journal this morning. Next up on our list today we have the drunkard's cloak. Speaking of shame, this was one method that definitely worked to embarrass anyone out of committing this crime and it also showed that maybe the Victorians had a bit of a sense of humor, although a very morbid one. So imagine you're in a bustling town square and there's someone looking quite ridiculous and moving awkwardly among the crowd. This poor soul is decked out in the infamous drunkard's cloak, which is basically a barrel turned into a heavy, uncomfortable garment. Think of it as the original cone of shame, but for humans. This barrel, often with holes for the arms and head, turned public drunks into walking spectacles. Walking around in this bulky, clunky barrel made any movement a challenge and attracted all kinds of stares, snickers, and maybe even a few rotten tomatoes from onlookers. This cloak wasn't just a punishment, it was a public statement. I partied too hard and look where it got me. Designed to shame the wearer and entertain the public, the drunkard's cloak was a bizarre blend of punishment and street theater. So next time you're thinking about overdoing it at happy hour, just be thankful you're not doing so in a time when the hangover could involve navigating the local market in a barrel. That would be horrible. Next up on our list, we have the silent system. Imagine stepping into a Victorian era prison and hearing absolutely nothing. That would be so creepy, right? And that is the silent system for you. Introduced as a shiny new way to keep prisoners from corrupting each other with their criminal chatter, this system took solitary confinement up a notch. Inmates were not only isolated, but were also required to remain completely silent. The idea was that the silence would help them reflect on their crimes and reform. Sounds noble in theory maybe, but in practice it was a lot more like psychological torture. The utter lack of conversation, the inability to express any thoughts or feelings often drove prisoners to the brink of madness. This eerie quiet was intended to cleanse their moral palate, but instead it often led to severe mental breakdowns. Talk about a punishment that leaves you speechless, literally and figuratively. Next up we are talking about the body. So imagine being punished for a brutal crime only to have your punishment punishment last into and after your death. It sounds kind of extreme, right? Well, back in the Victorian era for some particularly nasty crimes, the punishment didn't just stop with their last breath. Nope, back in the day. The justice system had a bit of a flair for the dramatic and the downright macabre. So after the execution, they might prop up the criminal's body for all to see, turning it into a public spectacle. Talked about this a little bit. Thinking of it as a chilling warning sign, like behave or this could be you. But wait, it gets even more more gruesome. Sometimes they'd even dissect the body. Yeah, I don't know why. They'd slice it open, pull it apart, often in front of an audience. This wasn't just for science, it was showbiz, Victorian style. It was like their way of saying the law had not only the power to take your life, but also to command your body after death. A reminder that the justice system held all the cards, making sure the memory of your deeds lived on as a lesson for everyone else. Next up on our list, we are talking about the shock drill. Okay, so you're in a Victorian era prison yard and there's no gym, but there's plenty of what you might call forced fitness. Enter the shot drill, a grueling exercise that could make even the toughest gym class look like an absolute walk in the park. Imagine lugging a hefty cannonball, hoisting it up to your chest with both hands and then shuffling across the prison yard to drop it off at the other end. Sounds pretty tough, right? So now picture doing that just over and over again from sun up to sundown. Down. This wasn't just about keeping prisoners busy or whatever, it was 
back breaking work meant to drain their energy and break their spirits. The shot drill was the Victorian penal system's way of adding insult to injury, keeping you physically exhausted and constantly reminded of your captive state. Talk about a heavy day's work. Imagine doing all of that, so you gotta do all of those drills with the can with the cannonball also, like we had nothing else, and then you gotta go inside and just be quiet after that. <laughs> you just can't talk at all. That would just suck. Okay, I don't know man. I really don't think I would have done well in the Victorian era. Okay, and finally on our list today, we have oakum picking. So imagine, again, you're a prisoner in the Victorian era, sentenced to oakum picking. Sounds like something kind of out of a craft fair, but uh, way better than that shot drill sentence. Well, maybe not quite. Imagine sitting there day after day, tearing apart old tar-soaked ropes that used to hold ships together. Your task is to pull these gritty, sticky ropes apart until all that's left are the fibers, which then get reused to play plug up leaks in ships, or stuff the very mattress you might be sleeping on, if you can call it sleeping. This isn't just tough on the mind, it is brutal on the hands. As you separate these fibers, your hands start to cramp, ache, and even bleed, thanks to the relentless, jagged edges of the rope. And just when you think you can't take another minute, you realize that your shift is not even close to being over. Oakum picking isn't just a job, it's a test of endurance, turning each day into a gritty battle against ropes that seem as tough tough as the life you are trying to survive. Imagine living somewhere where you could literally be asked, hey, uh, could you die over there please? Called prohibition of death laws. They've shown up through history and around the world, and some argue that not much action is taken to enforce or punish violators, but that's because it'd be kinda hard, right? Well, this is the island of Delos, considered a holy site by the ancient Greeks. You can see the many of the old temples and statues that were erected in worship of the gods there. Check her out, she's a beaut, Clark. Classic architecture, clear teal waters, and dream vacay. No better place than to die. Until the 6th century BC, when a whack job tyrant named Pisistrius ordered all of his soldiers, serfs, workers, whatever, to remove every dead body from the island as they had rendered it impure. Shovels and hands, they really did remove the dead bodies one by one until they felt they were all gone. I doubt you can actually remove all the dead bodies from any piece of land, but I imagine they probably got pretty damn close. And from there it became law in the Greek kingdom that it was illegal to die on the island of Delos. I guess if you drop dead, they just like leave a fine on your body, tuck it in your belt loop maybe, all saucy like, who knows. This wasn't the only place this happened though. Check out the coastal town of Le Lavador, France. Sheesh, what is up with not being able to die in luxury. This is nice. Anyways, due to the disputes over the crowded cemeteries, ordinances to build new cemeteries, and conflicts with local environments and environmentalists, the mayor just tossed his hands up and said, you know what? If nobody can share, nobody gets any. And passed a law forbidding residents from dying. See guys, this is why we use our words and our listening ears. For everyone who makes fun of people's height, just know the courts will favor a short king. You should never make fun of someone for something they can't control, and height is a big one. Men especially face a lot of scrutiny and rejection for it, and we're at a point where nowadays, if you're literally 5'8", people will say you're short. Gentlemen, that is not the case. So, if you've ever been called short, listen to this. According to the 18 Laws of Keen, a set of legal codes written on bamboo slips that were unearthed in the Hubei province in 1975, during the Qin Dynasty of China, there was a law stipulating that men and women shorter than the height 1.52 meters do not have to bear any criminal responsibility for any crimes they committed. Apparently, this was because the household registration system, known as Hukoi today, was incomplete at the time, so it was often impossible to verify a person's age. So, the government used height. The founder of the Qin Dynasty himself, Qin Shi Huang, apparently only reached 1.5 meters tall, that's 5 feet, when he was 22. So he allegedly believed that his subjects could only be defined as adults once they grew taller than that. So yeah, short kings prevail. Nothing is more freaky than government mandated furry costumes. Europe really tried just about anything in the way of public shaming to air out someone's criminal history. Unlike China or Japan, which literally tattooed faces, the Ottomans who cut off hands, or even their European ancestors who chopped off noses and ears, the 17th and 18th century Europeans took a new tactic, shame masks. The uncomfortable apparel was made out of solid metal and would have been painful and super heavy when strapped tightly to your face. Naturally, it's abrasive, it's rusty, it's riddled with tetanus. But don't worry, there are lots of cool styles, like these jaunty pagan gods looking dudes. As mentioned, there are the 
these weird animal heads like medieval furry getup. This one's a rooster, and apparently to quote, those who were, well, the other name for a rooster, swaggering and vainglorious, would be forced to wear a rooster mask for hours, even a day. Which may not sound that bad, but again, chafy, hot, heavy cast iron, the pressure of which is on your scalp and your collarbones. And apart from these terrifying masks, criminals were given humiliating badges they had to wear for, yeah, rest of their life. Next up, we got the M&M's Trial by Ordeals. And by M&M, I mean medieval and Mesopotamia, not the M&M candy franchise out here trialing people by fire. And while I may be joking around, these trials were no joke. If you stole a bunch of crap and you were caught, they just hang you, no questions asked. But when ordeals are deemed appropriate for the crime committed, well, they weren't effing around. You were about to go through the holy test ringer, and your punishment it failed was excommunication from the church, because God clearly didn't believe in your good name. Kind of like a Mean Girls Regina George burn book. But that was just the beginning. There were three types of ordeals for medieval Europe. Being tossed in cold water, and if you think you're innocent, float you're guilty, makes sense. Hot water ordeal requires you to pick a stone from boiling water and heal from those burns in three days if you want to be innocent. And finally, hot iron, because being able to carry a pound of boiling iron meant you were righteous. Did literally anyone pass that? Meanwhile, trial and ordeal in Mesopotamia allowed the gods to decide criminal accusations, in which case I hope they all learned how to float or swim young because God came in the form of a rapid river. The law goes as follows, if anyone bring an accusation against a man, the accused go to the river and leaps in the river. If he sinks in the river, his accused shall take possession of his house. But if the river proves that the accused is not guilty and he escapes unhurt, then he who has brought the accusation shall be put to death and the guy who jumped in the river gets to take the house of the accused, accuser, whatever. So what I'm hearing is welcome everyone to Mesopotamia's favorite game show, Drown or Win a House, where contestants go before the court, their gods, and one rapid river to face off the ultimate test. Are they innocent or guilty? And now for a punishment I don't even want to know how they discovered, tickly lickly torture. Some names are misleading and others are quite on the nose. This is a beautiful middle ground of both. And so the victims are laid out in front of a goat, their feet are covered in salt water, goats love them salt and they love sodium, so they lick and lick and lick at the sole of his foot. And fun fact for you guys who aren't out here feeling goat tongues up often or haven't eaten manish water, they're pretty much like giant cat tongues. So rough that once the skin is pruny from a couple batches of the salt water and goat spit, the abrasive tongue will literally rip layers of skin off the foot. There's been cases of this method going so far that goat licked to expose the bones. The punishment was only ever rumored to be used in medieval France and it's only ever described in a 1502 Italian document. Imagine a time and a place where asking some folks, hey, you want to get dinner and drinks would get you executed. The Han food restrictions. The Han dynasty had some fickle little food laws and regulations it appears, and for some reason they had wild punishments for them. For example, the law stipulates that dinner without a valid reason will be fined if caught, and if there's beef on the table it will be cut directly. Does that do something to the beef? I don't get that part. I also don't get the part where between 206 BC and 220 CE, having a few drinks with the boys could get you literally decapitated. The law stated that if three or more people got together to drink, the participants would be fined four towels of gold. If you're unable to pay, obviously you face severe consequences because why can you afford to drink but not pay a fee? The only exception to this rule were gatherings such as weddings, funerals, and festivals. Many rulers and dynasties attempted to regulate the consumption of alcohol in some part because making alcohol required grains like rice, and that supply was often short. Rulers also feared that drunken civilians could easily turn disorderly and violent and cause some peace issues. Can't talk unusual and freaky without bringing up the Mongols and their Yasa law. The Yasa decrees are only available to us through secondary sources as there's no comprehensive Mongol scroll or codex found so far. Naturally, this can be problematic and our knowledge of Yasa law is nothing like the older code of Hammurabi. This is due to the fact they, well, they weren't literate. So yeah, the laws were told verbally. What we know of Yasa, declared by Genghis himself, is it concerned itself with people, not property, and aimed for three things. Obedience to Genghis Khan, a binding together of nomenclads, and merciless punishment of wrongdoing. Nowadays we've managed to collect some of their laws together and I'm going to read you some of this list. So we have urinating in water or ashes is punishable by death. One may not dip their hands into water and must instead use a vessel for drawing water. Probably a hygiene thing, but at least it's not death, you know? It's forbidden to wash clothing until completely worn out. And don't forget when you do go to wash them, it's forbidden to bathe or wash garments in running water during thunder. I can't make sense of that one. And then also there's the one where parents can arrange a marriage between their children, even if one or both are already dead. But the weirdest thing aren't even the articles, it's the penalties. Only death is ever specified as a consequence. Adultery, death. Take someone against their will, death. Peeing in water, death. Don't answer con calls, death. Giving out food or clothing captives, death. Death, 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 death. Now, it also includes some pretty chill 
laws, like Genghis ordered that all religions to be respected and no preference be shown to any of them. So I mean, you win some, you lose some. Up next is like country boys at Boots and Hearts. You gotta chug, chug, chug. This law and punishment comes to us from the Sui Dynasty of China, which the duration was 581 to 618 BC. If you've seen some of my videos about ancient China, you may know that getting into the royal court for work could be pretty blessed for you, your biddy, and any kids or family you have. Some parents went as far as to snip their kids' junk so they could potentially be a eunuch for their emperor in the future. If you don't wanna do that, you could always take the imperial exam, the Keiju, which theoretically allows anyone in the country to become a government official. But failing the test was not without consequence, especially if you weren't neat. According to the Book of Soi, uh, the official historical records of the Soi dynasty, the law stipulated that examinees with bad handwriting would be punished by being forced to drink one shang of ink, aka a literal leader. Don't think you can drop out either once you learn that and you know you can't improve your handwriting in time. The penalty for dropping out is also to chug down some ink. Why so extreme over some exams? Well, exam and Answers were in theory written by the emperor, even though in practice his officials would be the ones doing the grading. So even if the emperor didn't see it, bad handwriting indicated disrespect to him, the son of heaven. Also, if you failed the examination, guess what your punishment is? Drink some more ink. Had to throw something violently nauseating in at the, on this list at some point, so we got death by Dumbo. This is gonna be rough, you guys, and it makes it obvious colonies of Asia were not effing around. Hope you're ready. So, elephants were used to crush and even gore criminals to death in medieval South and Southeast Asia. This method was popular in India from the Mughal period into the late 19th century. The criminals were laid down either face down, a blessing, I imagine, or face up to see their incoming demise, which was wild and angry elephants who ran over them repeatedly, ensuring a quick yet very painful death. The most common form, however, was mano a mano. When a convict was laid down and an elephant walked over to the execution site by the handlers and deliberately made to stamp on the torso or head. Elephants are clever creatures, and reportedly, they could be taught to slice and gore criminals to death with pointed blades fitted to their tusks. Imagine an elephant in a blind rage running at you with butcher knives duct taped to its tusks because that's literally what their last moments would have been like. All right, let's talk mud now. Not any old mud, it's mud, the glorious mud. Gonna say mud way too much, it's gonna feel made up. So execution by suffocation was a common practice of the ancients. Look at hanging or wax stuff, like water torment. However, in the medieval period, a very strange kind of suffocation technique was used called mud, the glorious mud. And yes, you have to say it like that, so follow me on screen. Mud, the glorious mud. Yay, okay, I'll stop. So some historians tell us that criminals would be killed by throwing him or her into a pit of stinky mud, usually also packed with human filth and feces, because this is medieval Europe. The convict would either die by drowning or by suffocation. However, this was also a common accidental death for the exhausted armor-laden soldiers laying injured on battlefields. Anyways, being drowned or suffocated in mud for punishment does seem to have been rare, thankfully, primarily known to happen in the Burgundy region of France, where it was a punishment reserved specifically for women who left their husbands. So we'll start with punishment one, tattooing. You may have seen our video the top 10 messed up punishments from the Tokugawa era, in which case tattoos as punishment may sound familiar. While Japan and China were on different wavelengths and doing their own things, this is something they had in common for criminals. Although tattooing has been known in China for centuries, it has been in the most part an uncommon practice outside of their indigenous peoples. Throughout Chinese history, tattooing has been seen as a defamation of the body, something undesirable, and this originates likely with the penal tattooing as one of the five capital punishments in ancient China. The first, and considered the lightest of the five punishments, had criminals' upper cheeks or forehead or other visible parts of the body tatted up. It was usually words that described their misdemeanors or the location of their exile or name of their hard labor camp. These tattoos are obviously permanent and very visibly marked out their bearers as ex-criminals for life. Even should the criminal ever return from exile, the tattoo would mark them as what they were. The Kinlaw Code covered so many offenses that common people people frequently did not realize they had committed a crime until they'd been arrested. So you really could be just minding your business one day and boom, face tat the next. Next is amputations. So after tattoos, the next was rhinotomy, aka the snip snip of a criminal's nose. Like tattooing, it left the victim scarred for life. But because sharp items and blood were involved, rhinotomy and the next two penalties following after often resulted in death, even if not their intention, just due to things like bleeding out or infections. Then, 
level three is amputation of feet, aka you. Modern day scientists have been examining a skeleton that was found from 3,000 years ago where the foot of a woman was cut off as punishment for committing a criminal act. Various clues hint that the woman's foot was cut off as a you. Her bones show no signs of any disease that could have made such an amputation necessary, and it seems that the injury was roughly made, rather than with the precision of a medical amputation. There were variations in punishments in different periods where the choice of foot removed depended on the severity of the crimes committed. Amputation of the right foot for a very serious crime and the left for lighter offenses. It would seem that the woman, who was determined to be in her early 30s when she died, had committed the former. There is extensive historical evidence of the practice of the third punishment, such as documents of a Chinese official in the millennial BC complaining about the demand to find special shoes for their amputee people. Remove the reproductives. It's called gong, the permanent removal of a person's reproductive function. Male victims of this punishment were castrated, losing the member as well as their boys. A very famous casualty it was Sima Qian, an emasculated father of traditional Chinese history writing. Gong punishments for female victims were harder as in the older times they didn't really know what was going on all up in there or how to access it. So it might have involved pounding a woman's abdomen with a stout stick to introduce some kind of damage to the womb. Call that waka womb, I guess? But um, no? No, all right. Then the final in the code, the last of the five punishments was death, obviously. However, there were different variations of death, from simple strangulation or decapitation to boiling or grilling a person alive and making literal mincemeat out of a person's flesh and then salting it. They got gorgeous with it, guys. The cruelty was deliberate and designed to cause maximum pain to the victims and their families, as well as to shock and deter others from committing similar crimes. A criminal might be sentenced to death by strangulation if left Less punitive or decapitation if more punitive. Strangulation was actually prescribed sentence for lesser crimes, lodging an accusation against one's parents or grandparents, scheming to kidnap a person and sell them, opening a coffin while desecrating a tomb. Decapitation was a method of execution prescribed for more serious crimes such as treason or sedition. Despite a great discomfort involved, most of the Chinese people actually preferred strangulation to decapitation in the ancient times, and this is the result of the traditional belief that the body is a gift from the parents and that it is therefore disrespectful to one's ancestors to die without returning one's body to the grave intact. Executions were usually carried out at 11.30 a.m. On the day of the execution, the convict would be carted from the jail cell to the execution grounds. The cart stopped at a wine shop named The Broken Bowl on the east side of the Zuanwu Gate, where the convict would be offered a bowl of rice wine. The bowl would be smashed after it was drunk, opa, and then her heads chopped off and and promptly sent to the emperor. Now finished with the five official punishments, let's check out some other whores, like the kangu, a type of large wooden collar placed around the necks of offenders, which could weigh differently depending on the severity of their crimes. Speaking of which, the Chinese empire really said, and we have the receipts for it too guys, as the criminal's past crimes would be attached to the wooden collar, most of the time for the public to see, grocery list style. The kangu also restricted a person's movements, so it was common common for people wearing kangoos to starve to death as they were unable to feed themselves and sometimes not even move from one place. If people were generous enough to offer food to the roadside kangoo wearers, they could also see the list of their crimes and determine based off of that if they deserved their generosity at all. After all, it was a device used for public humiliation and corporal punishment. Imagine seeing someone you've beefed with forever pop up one day on the street corner wearing one of these. You can just walk up and read everything they did wrong, just attached to them, that's satisfaction for a grudge holder, man. Stand your ground until you can't anymore, the neck tower. This torture and execution was done in two ways, either in a tall, narrow tower or in a tall wooden frame box. Either way, both tower or box could open only from the bottom side. A prisoner is put inside the wooden box frame or tower with only the neck protruding. Hands and feet would be shackled inside and only a towering pile of stones would be in there to stand on. However, each day, a stone or two is removed, dropping the prisoner lower and lower and lower by inches over the days, letting them die slowly by strangulation. Battle of the sexes with this torture, it's Zanzi, a form of crushing torture used to extract confessions or as a penalization for laws broken. Now may be a fun time to mention that the five laws of punishment I had just counted for you guys, those punishments actually only apply to men. For women, the five punishments are a different set and far less severe. 
First is grind and grain, second is the zanzi, which you're about to learn about, third punishment is beating, fourth is confinement, but also sometimes, as mentioned, she got her womb smacked about a little, and finally five, permission to take your own life. Not them killing you or telling you to do, no, 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 no. This was some like side eye, well, we're not telling you what to do, but you know what's up, dot, dot, dot type of thing. Anyways, the zanzi. This finger crusher was a Chinese instrument of torture consisting of small sticks strung together with cords, which was then placed around the fingers and gradually pulled, causing agonizing pain inwards. Think being tricked into playing knuckle breaker by your older brother for the first time. Under traditional Chinese law, a person could not be convicted of a crime unless they confessed. The zanzi was a legal and non-lethal torture method for forcing women to confess and for men there was a similar and more painful jiagun ankle crusher, which uses three yard long wooden planks that slowly pulled and compressed the feet in an excruciating fashion that both broke tendon and bone. Time to snatch that waist ancient China style, the waist chop. Waist chopping first appeared in the Zhu dynasty and sadly no, it was not truly a plastic surgery alternative to get that slim thick sama look going. In reality it's when a prisoner is tied to a table, whether lengthwise or widthwise, it doesn't matter, however it's definitely far less comfortable to be chopped in half while also awkwardly dangling your arms and legs off of a table. Anyways, lying face down, the executioner was to try, try being the keyword, to sever the person in half using a large fodder knife at the small of the back. These big ass knives were literally so heavy it was more like teetering forward and letting the blade kind of slam into the person and hoping for the best. Sometimes, most times, the chopping was not limited to one blow. A story from 1734 describes Yu Hong Tu, the education administrator of Henan, was sentenced to a waist chop. After being cut into at the waist, he remained alive long enough to write the Chinese character Chen, which means cruel, seven times with his own blood before dying. After hearing this, the young Zheng Emperor abolished this form of execution. I guess maybe after learning what happened to Hong Tu, the Emperor felt like half the man he used to be too. Huh? Yeah. We've heard it we've heard of it before. We'll hear of it again. It's Ling Chi, aka slow slicing. A regular torture and execution to reoccur in Bumblebee videos due to how far spread this torture traveled, how much it was used, and just how overall disturbing it is. Slow slicing, also known as death by a thousand cuts, was a form of torture and execution used in China from roughly 900 CE up until the practice ended around the early 1900s. The process involved tying the condemned prisoner to a wooden frame, usually in a public place. The flesh was then cut from the body in multiple slices in a process that was not specified in detail in Chinese law and therefore likely varied per empire or century. Generally it consists of cuts to the arms, then the legs and chest leading to the amputation of the limbs, followed by decapitation or a stab to the heart. If the criminal was less serious or the uh, executioner more merciful, the first cut would be to the throat. The punishment worked on three levels, as a form of public humiliation, as a slow and lingering death, and as a punishment after death. To be cut into pieces meant that the body of the victim was not whole in the spiritual life after death, which is massively consequential to many Chinese people who believed reincarnation required being whole in death. It is described as a fast process lasting no longer than 15 to 20 minutes. The coup de grace was all the more certain when the family could afford a bribe to have the stab to the heart inflicted first. Some emperors ordered three days of cutting, while others may have ordered specific tortures before the execution for a long longer execution. For example, records show that during Yan Chohan's execution, Yan was heard shouting for a half a day before his death. And finally, the nine degrees of punishment are ten shades of effed up. In the words of Mulan's Mushu, alright that's it, dishonor, dishonor on your whole family, make a note of this, dishonor on you, dishonor on your cow. Well the Qin Dynasty and a few others of China really felt this sentiment with their whole chest and it shows in the creation of the nine degrees. See the punishment in involved the execution of close and extended family members. These included the criminal's living parents, the criminal's living grandparents, any children the criminal may have over a certain age, which varied depending on the time period and who was in control and what their definition of a child even was. Also siblings and siblings-in-laws, uncles of the criminal as well as their spouses, and of course the criminal himself. Imagine messing up so bad your whole family line just gets annihilated. We all have that cousin or sibling who would have screwed all of us by now if this still happened. A famous documentation of the Nine Degrees is the story of Fang, a Confucian scholar famous for his loyalty to the Emperor Zhao En. When the Emperor is usurped and Fang is asked by the new one to write an inaugural address, well, Fang refuses. It's also ancient
ancient China, so realistically he knows exactly what refusal means, so that proves how metal his decision was. Even when threatened with family extermination, Fang showed his IDGAF attitude and is reported saying, never mind, nine agnates, go ahead with ten. Blowing steam out the ears, the emperor says, bet. And so Fang becomes perhaps the only case of extermination of ten agnates in the history of China. So quite literally, in addition to his own execution, the blood relations from all nine branches of his family hierarchy were killed. And as a kick to the nuts, his students and peers were added to be the tenth group. Random people unrelated to him who just happened to attend his lectures or work with the guy. Although altogether 873 people are said to have been executed. Because this guy refused to write a speech and when threatened said, do it bro, I dare you. Before death, Fang was forced to watch his brother's execution and then Fang himself was executed by waist cutting. And legend goes that prior to his death, he dipped his finger in his own blood and wrote on the ground the Chinese character Kwan, which means upsurper. Man was petty until the end and took 873 people with him to prove it. 